my name is Tom Miller. I have the honor of being the director of the Chesapeake Biological Lab, part of the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. And we offer this series as part of our commitment to engage with the local community to let them know what we do and how what we do impacts their lives. UMSEs has a unique mission, uh, a legislative mission, in fact, to conduct research on any aspect of the environment that affects the citizens of Maryland or helps inform people who make decisions on behalf of that, those citizens. Normally, we have the expertise to do that in-house, but every once in a while, we're challenged by working in areas that are well beyond our expertise. And um, tonight is one of those examples, and, and it is my absolute pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Samia Kirshner, a colleague from Morgan State University. Samia is a registered architect, um, the first time we've ever had an architect address um, the, these presentations. Um, she gained her undergraduate degree in her native Pakistan and then moved to the US for graduate school, first at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and then at Georgia Tech. Um, she then followed a career that took her to the Middle East to do a lot of work involving urban planning of, around port cities in the Middle East and came to Maryland, in fact, to Baltimore specifically to work around issues related to harbors and ports and connecting cities back to uh, the harbors that in fact are the reason why they existed in the first place. And she does some remarkable work engaging the local community to understand the community's needs and how the city can best change and adapt to meet those needs. Um, this presentation this evening will be offered as a Zoom conference. As such, it will not be possible for you to unmute and ask questions, but we do encourage you to type your questions into the chat box, which is accessible through the menus at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And at the end of Samir's presentation, I will moderate questions uh, and, and uh, combine themes and elements to explore some of the messages that she gives in her presentation the, the, this evening. So uh, with that, it is my utmost pleasure uh, to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Samir Kirshner. Samir, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Miller. It is a great honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And um, I would uh, uh, like to present uh, a little bit of a journey and um, what I have been collecting and how I am engaging it with the, um, along with my students at Morgan. So just a brief introduction to my work. I am um, an architect and an urban designer. And I have taught at three different universities. I've had the privilege of living in uh, what I consider my lost paradise, the University of Hawaii in Manoa. And from there, that was my first uh, full-time teaching appointment after I finished my PhD at Georgia Tech. Um, from Hawaii, I was recruited to develop the first architecture program in the Middle East, the only architecture program in the world that is fully accredited by NAB, which is the National Architecture Accrediting Board of the US. We were granted not a reciprocation, but a full accreditation because um, it's, uh, I'm very proud of that program that we co-developed with faculty from all over the world. And while developing that program at the American University of Sharjah, I found myself engaging with a lot of uh, global firms that were operating in the Persia, along the Persian Gulf, uh, consulting on urban design projects, as well as teaching um, uh, at the American University of Sharjah. Uh, one of the questions that has been central to my research is how water shapes cities and how cities shape the waters that they are sited along. So that reciprocal relationship is something that is central to my research. Um, when I arrived at the American University of Sharjah, it was uh, 
before um, the pivotal moment where our relationship, and when I say uh, our, I mean I'm in America now, I'm an American citizen now, and I consider myself a Western um, educated person. So when I say our relationship with the Middle East had not transformed yet because uh, I moved in 2000, that was much before, about a year and a half before 9-11. Um, we were developing some experimental programs in the Middle East when 9-11 happened and all the security demands on the, um, on the region started transforming the relationship. So the journey is a, a very intellectual journey, but also it is a journey that is grounded in that relationship. Um, and if I move, let's see, okay. So as I was saying, I've always cited myself in port cities so that I can extend and expand my research. Um, wherever I teach, wherever I live, wherever I play, I try to study it and I study it very closely. Um, when I arrived in the Persian Gulf, as I said, things were transforming very fast, but no one expected it to transform the way it did. One of the reasons for that massive transformation, the whole notion of the world map to be constructed along Dubai was conceived after 9-11 because there, were, there was $680 billion of divested Arab money from the US that was floating around. And Dubai and Abu Dhabi just captured it by proposing these what I at that time considered outrageous proposals. When I used to go, um, I remember very distinctly in November of uh, 2002, when I went to the first cityscape uh, exhibition, the proposal for the world was there. The proposal, outrageous proposals were there. And I was like, this must be a joke. This is not happening. And voila, it did happen. So that transformation that happened along the water had a very important impact that is in the blind spot of climate change researchers. And basically to create the islands that were being created, and I'm just talking about the image. Uh, when I put my cursor on the image, can you see the cursor? Okay, perfect. So I'm right now talking to the constructed islands. These islands were constructed from the limestone, and there is only one mountain range in the Rubal Khali, which is the empty quarters desert area, a one thin long limestone mountain that separates Oman from the United uh, Arab Emirates. And that was the stone that was used, boulders and boulders brought to the waterfront and placed, boulders placed in to create the island. So imagine, how displacement occurs, right? So you have this glass, I've marked it. When I put a boulder in there, it displaces. Nobody is calculating the impact of island construction on the sea level rise. And that is something that is happening across the world because the model was set in Dubai and it went all over the Persian Gulf, Saudi Arabian coast as well, and across the world. So all of this that was happening started replicating in different parts of the world as well. Majority, so on one hand, there was island construction with monumental buildings on it, like Abu Dhabi and Dubai. And on the other, the historic areas of smaller cities, smaller in the sense that they were second tier global cities like Sharjah and Doha, Sharjah in UAE and Doha in Qatar. They were transforming and I was part of the um, uh, client representative on the project Heart of Sharjah project, where literally in Sharjah alone, 300,000 square foot of real estate was going to be demolished by 2025 to reconstruct the heritage area as it was prior to 1970s. 
So I started questioning that why are we doing that? On one hand, we are creating new islands. On the other hand, we are uh, what was known as the creative demolition of historic areas and waterfronts. So that question was uh, on the forefront of my mind when I started documenting the whatever was remaining in these areas, in these heritage areas. Um, I also started looking at how could we, this was very early days of uh, the notion of sea level rise. And we could see the sea level rise because the waterfront in the Persian Gulf is very susceptible to the moving subka, the area between, and I will show you some maps which shows that every time it rains or when the water swells in the Arabian Ocean, it had an impact and there would be flooding in some areas, the creeks would go up. So we started looking at hypothetically, if we reversed the palm islands that were going to be constructed, and this is before they were constructed, what would be the measure of water displaced and how could we bring water in to create canals inland as opposed to creating waterfront property that would displace the water. So these are the things that were happening in my experimental lab in the American University of Sharjah. Now keep in mind, there is a difference between how the Hart Miller Island along the coast of Baltimore is constructed. There is no stone used to displace water here. This is island making that is utilizing the dredged material that the port authorities have to dredge in order to allow the large vessels to come into the port of Baltimore. So this island, while it is taking the actual dredge material and constructing an island, it's a totally different phenomena, does not contribute to the sea level rise, but the ones that were happening across the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula, along the Arabian Peninsula, are totally different. So I wanted to make sure that that distinction is there. This is um, not using stone from mountains, but actually the dredge material. So in Doha, the heart of Sharjah, which is this, uh, the heart of Doha project, which completely took down um, hectares of land where people were actually living and creating new building stocks to replace it with this. So the people who were living in those buildings that I just showed you would only be able to walk through the newly developed sites because they could not afford anything, not even a glass of water in these new um, projects that were being replaced. So what was happening across the world started to a certain extent in Vancouver, and I will go earlier to that as well in 1970s. This is 1980s in Vancouver when Hong Kong, um, the, the people from Hong Kong were buying real estate and there was not enough real estate to be found because Hong Kong itself was going to go back into China and not be the private enclave that it would have been. So the whole concept of Vancouverism started in Southeast Falls Creek, where a Falls Creek was created to develop waterfront property for the Hong Kong residents who were divesting from Hong Kong and investing in Vancouver. So this idea of Vancouverism is actually a colleague of mine, um, Trevor Bodhi, who has uh, exhibited across the world how it started and from late 1980s and has spread across the world, uh, changing the waterfront of many cities like the introduction of Miami River and creating um, tall towers, residential towers on the front line of the water. Dubai Marina also created in the uh, same tendency to, create, to develop a artificial body of water to extend the waterfront line. And you can see in the horizon, the Palm Island under construction at this time, the marina uh, came first. So all the waterfront properties around 2008, 2009 had started looking alike, replicating. And I started getting intrigued looked at Vancouverism as a phenomena, thanks to my colleague at uh, the University of uh, British Columbia who brought it to my attention, then tracing it backwards also to the most impactful um, uh, inner harbor redevelopment project in Baltimore. Going back to the history of the Persian Gulf cities, it's important to know, note that the Persian Gulf is a very, very unique water body. It is shallow, 
it doesn't get anywhere over 80 to 100 feet in depth. And it is also very narrow. All cities along the Persian Gulf, whether on the Arabian side, all the Persian side, on the side of the Iran, from Shat al-Arab all the way to the um, uh, Strait of Hormuz, all of the cities are responding directly to the water. And you can see I mentioned the Sapka. So all cities always leave this area open because they expect the water will swell. So they provide, create provisions for the water to come in and out. When the water is out, when it is ghaib, which means disappears, then you can walk over it and you can play cricket and football and soccer. But when it is covered, it doesn't damage anything. It just is there. So it's a very unique water body along with the geography, there is also a social dimension. On the Iran side, the waterfront of the Persian Gulf is uh, bordered behind the waterfront. There is the Zargos Mountains, which are up absolutely unclimbable and unpenetrable. And on the Saudi Peninsula, Saudi Arabian Peninsula side, there is the Rubal Khali, which is the empty quarter. Again, absolutely horrific geography. You can actually lose your sense of time, place, and coordinates when you are traveling through the Rubal Khali. So these two geographies, the mountain on the Iran side and the empty quarter of desert on the other side, created a very unique relationship between the waterfront cities of the two continents, so to speak. So what uh, uh, Lawrence Potter, um, another colleague of mine who was in um, American University of Sharjah momentarily as a visiting guest lecturer, he's at Columbia now. He has termed this the Persian Gulf cultural world that cuts across nations, religions, and ethnicities. It's a world in and of itself that is connecting the inland cultures to the Arabian Sea and to the rest of the world. To a certain extent, in my research, I have come to terms with the fact that water unites cultures while land divides them. So if we look at the geography, we can see the deepest part is not, it's still very shallow at moments. It is very, very shallow. And the, uh, the, uh, the furthest it gets, is still navigable by a day. So if you go back to this map, historically, the current ruler's family of Sharjah, the every emirate in the United Arab Emirates has its own ruler. So the ruler of Sharjah, Al Qasimi, is the same family that has been there for a very long time. This is actually an archaeological um, um, investigation that's happening. And Jeffrey Rose in 2010 created this map that shows that the Persian Gulf itself had rivers and it wasn't a gulf. It's a very recent phenomena that the water has gone out and now it's, it, it used to be a very connected land between the Persia and the rest of the Arabian Peninsula. So, the Qatsimi, and you can see this is one of the oldest maps that I found, 1564, that shows the Qasimis family on both sides of the Persian Gulf, the Iran side. And this is the current location of Bandarlinga. This is the current location of Sharjah. So both sides of the water were under the rulership of the same family. And, uh, and you can see another 1662 match, a map by Dutch cartographer that shows that both the Quaximi or the what they call the Qasimi Quaximi, the Qasimis were owning both the water territory and the land territory. So water as a territory is a historic phenomena. It's a very uh, recent Roman phenomena that uh, it's a, a Roman uh, uh, revitalization, the concept of mare librum, that the water has to be free, is a, a reincarnation of the Roman phenomena. But to a certain extent, in the 17th and the 16th centuries, the area of the Strait of Hormuz, 
and along the Persian Gulf in this area was a water territory that was governed by the local um, um, tribal lords who were uh, designated as the pirates because they would actually tally tax on the passing ships. And this is actually a, um, a painting that depicts the demise of Ras al Khaimah, which was one of the strongholds of the Kawatsimis in 1819, where the British Navy basically um, put an end to their active regime on the water territories and had a pact so that the Navy uh, ships or uh, the British Navy ships could um, go between the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea without having to pay taxes. So here again, you can see the map of 1800 shows that the Emirati coast has been liberated from the pirates, which in essence was the liberation from the local uh, tribals. So here is the map, the earliest map of Sharjah drawn by a British Navy person. You can see that it shows that the city is surrounded by a wall precinct with a fort right in the center, and I'll show you some images of it. And it is protected from the Persian Gulf through a sandbar. So this is the original configuration of Sharjah. And notice that it is protected from the desert, but open to the water. There is no defense architecture along the water. All the defense architecture is historically, and this is 1822 map. So the city is very open like other, and I'm just using this as an example of a typical port city along the Persian Gulf. The city activities were completely open to the water. The water was part of the city. It wasn't a front or a back. It was part of the city. The desert was the back of the city, if anything. We can see here people just flowing into the water because it was shallow. The sandbar was protecting them. The two sides of the sandbar and the city were communicating very, um, uh, very fluidly across. Here are some remnants of the architecture that still survived. This is an aerial view of Sharjah as it um, uh, has retained some of its historic buildings. Many of the modern buildings have erased it. You still see the sign of this meandering souk with shops on both sides, shops that open on two sides. And you can see even the modern buildings have retained shops on the ground floor so that you have almost a penetrable opening between the water and the city souk or the bazaar where the commercial goods would be taken. So when you look at the inventory of this, uh, the city souks, you can see behind this gentleman, there is water, literally. So one side of the shop is open to the souk or the bazaar or the commercial uh, strip, and the other side is completely open to the water. In a way, and the souk itself, the bazaar or the commercial strip, that ran all along the length of the city with penetrable, what I call the, um, the continuation of the floodplain into the architecture of the, build, of the city. So the shops on the ground floor were going to be able to take in and all of the storage was on the upper floor so that the goods could not be dispersed. So the, if the creek went up, it would go through the shops and not the residences. So the land use that was developed was in sync with the notion of water rising because the water always rose throughout the life of the city since the 16th century. Here you can see my students um, and uh, the fluid nature in which the shops to this day exist, completely open one side to the water, the other side into the souk. Here is another uh, view of uh, the city, the picture taken in 1931. You can see the dotted line in white in the background. This is where um, the British were negotiating with the then ruler of Sharjah on where to put the landing strip for the airport. That was the first airport on the Arabian Peninsula 
developed in 1931 for British uh, imperial heir to land on its way to India. And you can see that the character of the buildings at that time was such that shops lined the waterfront, the district, each residential district had its own name, and the fort that's, uh, that is still there, uh, to this day reconstructed, but still there, was protecting the city from the desert. There is no defensible architecture, defense architecture on the waterfront. All the defenses, the wall, the fort, are all in the desert site. The Sahat al Hissan or the open market right outside the fort is where the nomadic um, uh, tribes of the desert would come and trade, bring palm frond and uh, dates from the desert and exchange it with rice and sugar that was coming from India through the waterfront. So we see these traces still alive. Some in 68 were very, very close to, you can see the water uh, is right here, but the cars are also there. So you can easily hop from the ship to the car, to the shop very, very um, fluidly. So another dimension of thinking about cities, other than how the water rises when, it in, uh, when, it, uh, when the city is lying next to it, is the issue of topography. And now I'm talking about areas that are away from the water, like far away on the upper hills where the watersheds actually start. So when we design with terrain, we can allow the water to move through the city in a way that does less damage. Unfortunately, that is not how we design for vehicles. We kind of create the um, crow's straight line and ignore topography. When we ignore topography and when massive rain happens or flooding happens, the infrastructure is destroyed because the infrastructure is not in sync with the topography. So that is the second dimension, which takes me away from the waterfront and looks at how urban design, sensible urban design needs to allow the water to flow through spaces using gravity as opposed to other um, non, um, uh, non organic ways of, of creating the infrastructure. One of the oldest cities in the world, I have had the privilege of being raised very close to it. So I had access to it from day one. And I think one of the reasons why I'm an urban designer today is because the archaeological excavations that we used to just play in, in the backyard. So Indus Valley Civilization, with its oldest city, Mohenjo-daro, that actually used topography to create the world's first designed sanitation system. The first planned city in the history of urban design is Mohenjo-daro. And you can see that the city includes water as a system to plan around by using the topography and gravity to move water from the reservoir, public path as well as the reservoir, to individually each and every house. Every house in Munjadaro had free flowing water. So the public amenity water was designed with careful integrity to pass through the city, keeping it clean and functioning 5,000 years ago. So when I arrived after 14 years being in um, along the Persian Gulf, located in Sharjah and documenting the cities over there, when the opportunity came to come back and repatriate uh, for family reasons, I wanted to plant myself in Baltimore because all the creative destruction that I was questioning, everyone in the ruler's office was giving me the same answer. It worked for Baltimore, the inner harbor redevelopment. They used creative destruction to launch the redevelopment project. So I really was curious, did it really work for the city? That was the research question with which I arrived in Baltimore and started studying the inner harbor redevelopment 
one of the earliest projects of waterfront redevelopment using public funds and private partnership to launch the TIFs or the tax incentive financing in which the city invests in private developers to develop land that belongs to private individuals. The land is procured through eminent domain claiming public good. So that history is a very interesting history from Inner Harbor version one. We have the Inner Harbor East version two and now in the process is version three. So when I started looking at the relationship, the historic relationship between the water and the city of Baltimore, some very interesting things happened and I started planting my urban design studio so I could uh, work with my students to collect more data on three neighborhoods. Why these three neighborhoods? Um, basically, I started with the, the neighborhood of Tivoli in Cold Stream Homestead and Montebello, then went to Westport, and now I planted myself in Park Heights. So why these three neighborhoods? These three neighborhoods tell a very interesting story of housing segregation in Baltimore. Um, if we look at uh, the couple of books that I'm citing over here, very important, uh, Apartheid Power, uh, uh, Jared Power's Apartheid Baltimore Style, the Residential Segregation Ordinances of 1910-1913 is a very important starting point where people started showing the repercussions of urban policies on um, uh, city development. Keep in mind when HUD was developed, Housing and Urban Development Authority, Baltimore was the closest metropolitan city, other than DC, of course, but HUD didn't want to experiment in itself, in its own city. So Baltimore was used as an experimental ground for all the ordinances. Um, so when we look at the redlining map, and the redlining map is the map that HUD drew to for banks to limit the investment of GI Bill um, money into neighborhoods in many cities, including Baltimore. So when we look at the 1940s redlining map, which is something that I've been studying um, with my colleague, Dr. Lawrence Brown, who has actually given the phrase, um, the black butterfly to these neighborhoods, it's very important to recognize that imminent domain was used to renew the downtown of Baltimore, to displace the people who occupied the houses along the downtown and revamp the area to develop the inner harbor. So the demolition that still is ongoing, just in the last uh, five years, $600 million have been invested in demolishing the row homes in Tivoli, 98. Uh, houses demolished over one night, that is the the, that June 20, 2015, which is the second year when I started studying the city of Baltimore, that um, demolition was happening in front of me. And that is one of the reasons why my first studio was uh, taking on the challenge of revitalizing this area that was flattened for development. It still stays flattened. Um, if we look at the historic 1903 map, that was drawn by Olmsted brothers, and I'm going to put a quotation over here, whatever happens to the present generation, it should not be allowed to go on heaping up difficulties and expenses for its successors. Olmsted is considered one of the first environmentally um, oriented landscape architects. He is famous for his design for the Central Park in New York City. He also gave a proposal for the city of Baltimore, some parts of his proposals were developed, like the Druidville Park and the Clifton Park and the Carroll Park. So if you look at his map and he meticulously, his company uh, meticulously created a topographic map of the city, which brings attention to one of the highest spots in the city, right around the Silburn area, which is current Park Heights. That's the highest place on the city that feeds both the uh, Jones Falls as well as the Gwen Falls. Park Heights contributes water shed of two sides, two sides of its existence. If we look at the 
map that Olmsted Brothers drew with its topography and its location of all the watersheds, you can see the Baltimore city vacancy and city parks. Baltimore has 16,680 empty buildings and or lots. That's almost one third of the buildings stock, building stock or empty land. And you can see clearly that where these places are located are the redlined areas. So the implication of vacancy and its historic relationship to um, the redlining of the Baltimore city is uh, very easily uh, legible as Dr. Lawrence Brown has documented in his book, The Black Butterfly. Um, what we have proposed in the eight years that I have conducted the urban design um, studios in different neighborhoods is to really allow the water to flow through the city so all of the city neighborhoods have access to it. It's not going to be difficult, but with the billions coming in in the infrastructure improvement projects, it is becoming a little closer to reality. At least create these pockets of areas where people can have access to water along the city's watershed. This will allow not only for the sensible rise of the water inland without destroy, destroying the infrastructure on the waterfront alone. It will also give equitable access to the water from neighborhoods. So one of the reasons why I have parked myself in Park Heights since 2017 is because that is the highest plane. If we can keep water in place in Park Heights, that is going to have a phenomenal effect on the watershed. Park Heights with its empty lots has the capacity and also being highest in the city of Baltimore at 480 feet plain uh, above the sea level. It has the capacity to reduce one tenth of the storm water that goes into the Chesapeake. So when we look at these vacant lands, when we look at the historical development of these vacant lands, we can definitely, or, and when we see the demolition that has taken place up until now to create the vacancy, we can either put back buildings on it or all, it's ironic because this is exactly, to me, these two images of this family looking at the house being torn down under the guise of creative demolition and this building that was fully occupied in Sharjah being torn down to recreate the historic 1950s buildings is very ironic because here the building was vacant and there were no people to be housed here. And in Sharjah, these were fully occupied buildings. The city was growing, but the creative demolition was used as a uh, example from Baltimore. So when we go back to Park Heights and look at the empty lot, this is a 16 acre site, which has been completely uh, demolished to make room for development. NHP development has been earmarked for the project. And uh, we meanwhile are arguing that this is a perfect place to capture water. It is the site, which is the highest in city. It contributes water uh, runoff to both the uh, Jones Falls, as you can see over here on this side, and Gwynn's Falls on this side. And this is, if you look at the relationship to that lot, to the watershed, you can clearly see that it's situated here. And if you cut a section, as one of my students has diligently done in the studio, here is the terrain. And this section is cut all the way from Park Heights to the Baltimore watershed over here, cutting through the large Druid Hill Park, which is um, has tremendous terrain, as you can see over here. Here is the relationship between Jones Falls and Park Heights. You can see that there are many streams that are hidden underneath the developments that can be daylit. Day um, so I'm not going to bore you with that, but continuously we've been in these spaces 
uh, across different courses, not only urban design, but I, now I'm actually teaching a tandem course that is connecting the undergraduate architecture students with graduate planning studios so that we can work together and address the needs of the communities, the basic need of the community, there are pockets of flooding and also vacant plots that are underutilized, as well as the impact of the largest food desert, which is also the designation of park heights. It is one of the largest food deserts with the lowest tree canopy. So um, when the pandemic hit summer of 2020, my students who were graduating the class of 2020 couldn't find jobs. So I put in a grant and I worked with farmer Chippy to create a kitchen for plantation park heights, which is located right here, that draws volunteer student bodies from all of these different high schools and uh, elementary schools around the uh, park heights. And the students not only come to volunteer, but they also learn about biology and chemistry on site with, the, with their teachers. When the pandemic hit, that became the source of food because the schools shut down. So the plantation park heights and urban farm supplied food to these students. So looking at the partnership structure, if we connect the colleges to the schools with community needs, we have a perfect situation for urban ecology to be the center of developing cities in sync with community needs to connect the high schools with colleges so that equitably we provide access and inspiration to schools. When, my, when I see my students working on the farm side by side with the K through 12 student volunteer team, not only are they inspiring those students to pathways to design, they are also learning in exchange. So we designed this, um, uh, we co-designed with the community this urban seeds kitchen, because this is how Farmer Chippy actually cooks and um, gives the food. And if it's raining, he cannot operate uh, unless he moves into this uh, hoop house. So what we did is we designed a kitchen for him, which is under construction. And once it is uh, constructed, it will allow the volunteer urban farmers to actually um, produce, preserve, as well as um, engage with the college students. Here is Farmer Chippy engaging with my students, teaching them how food sovereignty is one of the biggest challenges in Park Heights and how these urban farms can address that challenge. So from food sovereignty, the kitchen has actually been um, exhibited. It was nominated, so it was selected for the exhibition. And um, as you can see over here, the landscaping has begun and the containers are on site. The next step is to get the solar panels and get it running because there was no electricity. So we are generating our own electricity. We are capturing, as you can see over here, the drums on one side capturing the rainwater for the plumbing and uh, facilities of the bathroom. We are also using the issue of food sovereignty. I just got recently a grant to cultivate food in our own terrace in the Cebus building where our students and we have a swanky modern building and there is no food around us. Everyone has to sit in a car and drive at least 10 minutes away to get food. So through a grant, we are actually going to start developing the land on the roof terrace, which is, uh, it's, a, it's a lead platinum building. So it has that provision. So we're going to have um, food growing this summer so that our students are food sovereign. Um, if you have the ch chance, I have the URL link to the video of this project that was documented. And I'm open to comments. And I think I did not exceed the time if I am correct. So, Mia, you certainly didn't uh, exceed your time. And um, I hope everyone who had the pleasure of listening to you uh, now understands why, whenever I left discussions with you, I always feel better about the world around me.
um, that was really wonderful to tie uh, your own heritage and, and the work that you've done in the Gulf back to uh, Baltimore and the issues of, of controlling water and, and re, re, redevelopment um, of Baltimore itself. Um, I uh, encourage those in the audience, if you have questions, to please uh, type them into the chat box and, and I'll um, moderate those questions. While we're waiting for those to come in, I'm going to claim moderate the privilege and ask one of my own. Um, how do we deal with water quality in places like Baltimore when we're bringing the water back into the city? How do we ensure that the water that we uh, bring into the city or allow to form in, in the city uh, is clean and healthy and supports the kinds of neighborhood that we want? So the clean water, so there are two issues. One is the plumbing infrastructure. So deferred maintenance of the plumbing infrastructure and the lead that is used in the plumbing infrastructure, that is one issue that I'm not touching because that's an issue that is beyond my professional um, uh, expertise. So that is one issue. The second issue of capturing water and letting it seep into where it falls, that is where the most work is needed. Park Heights had the, had the opportunity by having approximately 480 empty lots that can capture the water. Rather than developing for real estate, if we capture and if we let the urban farms, um, which are doing very well, they supported single-handedly the that Plantation Park Heights was the hub for food distribution for the whole city. Nobody anticipated the pandemic would happen. He was just growing food. He just had to double it and triple it for the pandemic. He did get USDA grants to do that. So if we can figure out a way to capture the water in place, over time, the aquifers will become clean. So we need to just let the water seep into land as much as possible. That will not only create a cleaner aquifer and drinking water, it will also reduce the runoff water into the watersheds, which carries with it the pollutants on the roads, and then that is what pollutes the Chesapeake. So just by capturing water, we can actually address two parts of the one side that I am addressing, not the plumbing, that's not my expertise. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. It does. It does. So, um, uh, Jack Tem T Templeton, who nearly always asks questions after these presentations, um, talks about the fiscal uh, viability, the fiscal feasibility of these projects. There's such a uh, an economic pressure to redevelop and 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 build things that people can buy. It is, in his words, sort of uncovering the long covered creeks in Baltimore. Is it going to be economically fe feasible? So I think that's a very important question. And again, it has several um, inlets for me to enter. I'm going to enter the inlet of real estate. Real estate seems to in the US have this notion of investment. While I was in Hawaii, I encountered the author of, I'm sure you've heard of the book, Rich Father, Poor Father. So that author mm -hmm. actually told me something that I was, has changed my worldview about real estate. Real estate is not an investment because there is no return of the investment. When you buy a house and you live in it, that's not an investment, that is basic shelter. So this idea of real estate, especially real estate that is created to generate fiscally rent, 
how is it that we've been using imminent domain, pushing out people from their houses for, so to speak, public good, and creating real estate for people living in Texas or any other part of the country so that they can rent it out? So fiscally, that doesn't make any sense to me, not in my worldview. And of course, the worldviews might be different. And maybe there is time to rethink these things. Now, keep in mind, when 1903, Olmsted brothers created the map that they wanted to see, there were a lot of areas where they were proposing daylighting of the stream. And if you go to a neighborhood, which is homeland in Baltimore City, the daylighted streams have generated the value of real estate 15 times more than anywhere else in the city of Baltimore, just by creating, and at that time, Olmsted Brothers plan was uh, actually fiscally sensible because it said, keep these streams daylit, and if they were covered, re-expose them. That one small experiment of the duck ponds and the houses that are around it, the $2 million houses around it, shows that this is a fiscally feasible to daylight the streams over generations, the equity that is built. I hope that addresses the issue. It yep, can be addressed I, I from very too. different perspectives. And also keep in mind, the infrastructure bill is going to pump in billions of dollars in infrastructure. This is the time to think outside the box. Thanks. So related to that sort of point, um, Jerry Henger asks, um, how do the local and state governments and sort of associated uh, agencies feel about this pr project? What's, what's their sense? And you told me a little about this before the the talk came on so that one that question set 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 you up very well so i think that um, you know recently as i was telling you secretary of transportation uh visited us just two days ago um when was it tuesday or last week thursday i believe i have my days mixed up and he came to Morgan State University in my building because the Department of Transportation has their transportation center here on my, in my campus, in, in my part of the campus. So he came to our building and he had a very, very clear message. All of the infrastructure bill that has been passed, that will have to serve the underserved population. And he came specifically to Morgan State University to pass a message that we need Morgan State University to connect with the communities that, are, that have been historically underserved. So we have a wonderful opportunity to rethink how we think of development from the narrow perspective of real estate development. We need to think the infrastructure of pedestrian mobility we need to take topography into account. Yes, we are very, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, prolific in our investment in smart cities, but smart cities need to also be commonsensical cities. We need to respect topography. We need to learn from indigenous ways in which cities along the water have dealt with rising water in order to deal with the new climate change based rise of water. It's the time is really right to rethink um, how we develop cities. And there is so, money coming in. So I'll, I'll take another um, moderator's pr pr privilege. You've talked a lot in your presentation tonight about the connection of the city to the water with the water being access to trade. Um, I, I come at this topic at as, as a different uh, viewpoint, right? I view the water as, as a resource in and of itself and, and a healthy wa waterfront being a, a, a responsibility. So, so it, is, it, 
is it possible to redesign cities with the specific connection between the harbor and the coastal waters in mind? Is, is that something that we can do um, in our redevelopment? And Absolutely. if so, how? If, if, we can, if we can create islands on water, we can do anything. So, if, <laughs> right? If we can take a mountain and put it into the water and create a city out of it, we can do anything. Um, and I think that it has to be um, taken into account that we do outrageous things all the time. And this is not an outrageous thing. This is thinking with nature. So if you look at the FEMA map, and I, uh, that's uh, my bad that I didn't include it. If you look at the FEMA map, wherever we have done something nonsensical that defies common sense and uses a bulldozer machinery to defy common sense, water is taking over that land. Mississippi, Chesapeake, whenever there is flooding, all the land that has been developed through a bulldozer and a machine is going back to the water. So we need to kind of enhance our development with machinery, not in spite of common sense. I think that is the that that has to become a very um, very important foundation for any new development. Let's take common sense and then enhance machines in use of common sense rather than to defy, rather than flatten the terrain, let's work with the terrain. Yeah, yeah. It, it was um, surprising as you talked about um, the, the physical geography of the Persian Gulf how many similarities there are to the Persian Gulf and the Chesapeake in terms of scale, in terms of average depth, in terms of the connectivity east to west, um, in terms of the role of, of um, small port areas um, connecting to one another. And, and that's something that we, we seem to, to have lost. Well, so, um, so I think that... Uh, one of the questions that has come in, that is really an important one. How do we get organizations like Army Corps of Engineers to think in this way? It's happening actually. In the city of Philadelphia, there is this one unique woman who is working for the Army Corps of Engineers and she is fighting this mentality and she's successfully fighting it. So the Army Corps of Engineers now has one, uh, what do you call it? A seed of growth. And I think that we will see some change because she is a very vocal person. And uh, I recently saw her presentation and she is fighting the good fight. Good. So it's happening. It's happening. All right. Well, um, sadly, we've run to the end of our allotted hour. Um, and uh, on behalf of everyone, Samia, I really want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, that, as I said, always leaves me more op op optimistic than I, than I start out. So thank you very much to all who have attended tonight and those who have attended all five lectures. I want to express our gratitude uh, to you for giving of your time over these last five weeks. A reminder that all of these uh, will ultimately be available on our website. Um, and um, the questions that we didn't get time to answer, we will send to Samir, and I'm sure she'll take the time just to send uh, the question as a, a, a quick response. Um, I want to thank you again, Samir. Thank you, everyone who joined us tonight. And we look forward to seeing you all back in September when we have a, a, an autumn season. Uh, and uh, Sarah Brzezinski, who helps me organize these, she and I have both thought it's time to get back to the charismatic animals that we haven't talked about for a while. So expect an autumn session on uh, nat natural resources. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you 